Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Prime Minister and President Banga, for being here. We're really honored. Thank you. I have yeah, to. Deserves to be called Prime Minister. Just call me RJ. <laughs> this president thing doesn't work. Yeah, I, I, well, and guess what? I have three letters. Call me Mia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll see if I can work up to it, but let me first say, just a, a, as a reporter, this is an especially meaningful panel for me to be moderating. Uh, last year, uh, I began hearing about efforts that were starting to percolate in Bridgetown, Barbados, to reform the institution of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund with the intention of unlocking more capital to help the countries that need it most adapt and mitigate climate change. It was then, later after that, after I did a story that I had a, an interview on this stage last year with the president of the World Bank uh, about climate, that preceded the appointment of Ajay Banga, who I've known for 10 years from my work as a business reporter as the new president of the World Bank. So this whole story has come full circle, and it's a real privilege to have both of you here. Thank you very much for having us. Prime Minister Motley, I want to ask, I mentioned this Bridgetown Initiative, which was brought together by you and your staff, and you brought economists, members of the UN, NGOs, to Bridgetown Barbados last year, and came up with a new vision of how institutions like the World Bank, other multilateral development banks could operate to better help climate vulnerable nations. It's been more than a year now. Yeah. You just had a climate finance in Paris with President Trudeau, uh, excuse me, Macron. Macron. <laughs> I want an update, though. How is it going? Are the reforms that you've been talking about for more than a year now any closer in sight? Well, let's put it this way. Last year on this stage, you were told that you weren't sure, they weren't sure that there's a climate crisis. <laughs> and this year <laughs> on this stage, you have someone who will report progress on debt pause clauses. So I think that that more than anything else can be the poster child of where the change has started. Mm. Of course, m progress is not the accomplishment of a mission. And to that extent, there are other things that we want to see. Um, two years ago, we were talking about the need, and in fact, the original version of the Bridgetown Initiative called on the IMF to establish some kind of mechanism that would consider vulnerability as an appropriate criteria for lending. Since then, we have the Resilience and Sustainability Trust that, in fact, now will allow middle-income countries that are vulnerable to be able to access long-term capital with a 10-and-a-half-year moratorium. That did not exist at all before. Similarly, we've seen an increase in the capital of the bank. It is not what we need and what we would like, but it is going in the right direction. Um, as I said in Paris, our concern now is for speed and scope. And similarly, as I said yesterday, apart from that, we need to also go into greater granularity. I am concerned that the issue of debt sustainability needs to take greater focus. And the truth is that if we continue to ask countries to continue to undertake austerity in order to fit metrics that may no longer be appropriate or useful, then you're not going to see sustainable growth. Every country in Europe, I believe, is already reflecting a debt to GDP ratio mm -hmm. of about 90%, even though the Maastricht Treaty would have indicated that 60% is the target. The reality is that everyone is observing it in the breach because in a polycrisis moment, when companies and households cannot move with alacrity or indeed with capacity, governments have to step in as has happened. And therefore, we have to be able to realize that if we are to give true meaning to the Bridgetown Initiative and to the Paris Agenda for People and Planet, we cannot separate the m removal of poverty and the need for SDGs from the aversion of a climate crisis. The two are together the mission of countries because we <coughs> save on one and lose on the other. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Ajay, as you've taken on this new role this year, I know you came to the bank with a, a long interest and engagement in the climate crisis. And at the same time, that's not the mission, necessarily, of the World Bank. How have you, in your first months on the job, tried to address what Prime Minister Motley just described as this polycrisis? How are you working 
on addressing all of these simultaneous challenges at the same time? So, David, the fact is that, you know, the first uh, 90 days between my being nominated and getting, uh, getting elected, I had a chance to meet about 90-odd countries and 100-odd civil society folks and maybe 15 or 20 CEOs from asset managers and the like. And what comes across very clearly is this idea of segregating poverty and climate, poverty and fragility, poverty and food insecurity. These, you can't, they're all intertwined. The second thing that came across very clearly is that um, there is a growing divide between what we now call the global south and the global north. I don't like those terms, but they mean a certain thing, and that's the developing world has a problem with this. And they have good reason for it. They have three principled reasons, all of which I'm trying to address in this vision. And we can go into those reasons if we have time. But the vision that we're amending is to eradicate poverty on a livable planet. And a livable planet allows me to widen the aperture of the way the bank looks at the issue to include climate, fragility, pandemics, all of which are important. And that's what we're trying to do. And then there's a whole sequence of things that flow from there. But the two things I wanna make sure you know, one is inclusion is very important in this. And I have said that while everybody should be included, I want to really focus on women and young people. Mm. Women, because it's obvious they're half the population, and even today, even in the developed world, they don't get a fair shake on everything. And in the developing world, it can be even more challenging. So I just feel like the bank's effort and energy must go to make a difference to how women get an opportunity. Mm. And the second one on young people is because the global south, which is where our efforts go, are full of young people. And their hopes and their aspirations, their optimism is what could drive our world. But that only is true if when they're growing up, they have quality of life. And when they are grown up, they get a job. And quality of life is health, education, clean air, clean water. Mm -hmm. If we don't get that right, this so-called demographic dividend that we keep talking about in the global south actually converts into a demographic challenge with so many people who feel disenfranchised from what their optimism deserves to receive. Mm. And so I, I'm actually quite concerned about this aspect, and I believe that women and young people, growth and jobs and quality of life must be enshrined in the way we think about poverty and livable planet. Mm. Thank you. Prime Minister, can you give us a sense of how these interrelated crises are playing out in a country like Barbados? When you actually travel the country and see both the effects of climate change and all the economic, also the economic realities of, of your citizens trying to make their best in a uh, hotter nation where the sea level is rising. How do you think about as a, a leader of the country and also as someone who has a seat at the table of these conversations bringing together these crises? Look, the truth is it's extremely challenging. Um, and it's not challenging just for small states, it's challenging for most of the countries globally, including the developed world. And that's perhaps the good thing, because since it is challenging for the developed world, the sense of urgency has come to the table in a way that it hasn't been for decades. Um, we believe that we need policy space and fiscal space. And regrettably, we have been the takers of terms when the WTO was formed and we said, look, we don't have the capacity to distort global trade in goods and services. We, we have 0.00% in goods and 0.001% in services. So therefore, please give us special and differential treatment so we don't destroy our manufacturing and our agricultural sectors. Well, we could as well have been whispering into the wind, shouting into the wind. Nothing happened, declines of 34% in, um, and 22% respectively. So we determined, and that's really the, at the core of the Bridgetown Initiative, that this one-size-fits-all prescription for policy and regulation is not working. And at the same time, when you dig deep, you realize that the developed world are supporting farmers, the developed world are doing things that they tell us not to do. And even when we're talking to children, you really don't have credibility when you tell them, do as I say and not as I do. So that the hypocrisy of the post-imperial order is really hitting us in a way that does not make it easy for us to go wrong. When you compound that 
with the reality that people will look for opportunities and jobs by moving out of the country if they can't find a livable wage, then you are beginning to see the disparity even more because the world accommodates the movement of capital, but it doesn't accommodate the movement of people. And therefore, migrant is a bad word, even though 40 million people had to move last year. So these are the things that we've come to the table to say enough is enough, and that we don't expect manna from heaven. But what we do expect is a fair chance and a level playing field. And when we say we want to deconstruct the risk that makes the lending to the global south prohibitively expensive as compared to lending in the global north, then I think we know what we mean. Mm -hmm. Let us deconstruct it. If there's currency risk, how much of it is currency risk? Are we overpricing currency risk in the loans to the south? By how much? What can we do? Is there information um, deficit? Um, if that is so, let's build capacity to give you the information that you need so that you can make sensible decisions on what the real risks are. Is there a need for there to be a re-education of both economists and the credit rating agencies? Probably, because what we're doing is buying into this instantaneous world where from fast food to short-term money, all of these things are killing us. And what we genuinely need is long-term development funding that will allow us to build schools and pay back for them, that will allow us to build hospitals and pay back for them, that will allow us to boost our human capital so that we have the people to be able to pay back, and that will allow us to be able to have a sensible framework for investment from foreigners, but at the same time, start to recognize that if you put all your eggs in one basket and only measure GDP, when a hurricane or a major crisis hits you, then the whole country collapses. So we really do need to have a network of diversification and perhaps start to measure more GNI rather than GDP to encourage countries to start to diversify part of their investments at the level of both the public sector, the private sector, and those responsible for social security. By the way, if the... <laughs> if the if she actually gets hit by a hurricane, here's how serious it is. It's not a few percentage points of her GDP. Yeah. She will lose double digits in one day. And possibly triple digits. And, and then for her to build back, everything she just said gets multiplied a few times over. People forget that. Well, earlier this year, the World Bank, under your leadership, announced that it would start pausing debt repayment for countries recently hit by severe disasters. That's just the kind of thing that Prime Minister Mali and her team have Actually, been calling we for. It together. We had a rock concert. We beat you hollow, man. This is not a rock <laughs> concert. We did it at a rock concert. I think many people said that was a great first step, but many people in the same breath said, and why can't the bank go much further, much faster? Yeah. What's preventing the bank from offering loads of concessional finance, from offering more debt repayment, including for old loads, or even for pausing debt at all. I mean, a lot of these countries say, we don't need more debt. We need support. We need actual grants on the scale that big developed nations can provide. So I mean, the, the, the fact is the bank does a great deal of grants and concessional lending through a thing called IDA, which is the International Development Agency. IBRD, which is the bank lending arm, also provides money that's long term, 20 years and the like at somewhat lower than market rates, but the market rates themselves are what Mia was referring to. Uh, what, what prevents us from doing more? Because we have a certain balance sheet that we want to sweat up to a certain point. Part of the evolution roadmap right now is to see how we can sweat our balance sheet more. So one of the things we're doing is look at loan to equity ratio, we've launched a hybrid capital instrument, we've launched portfolio guarantees, we're trying to raise money for global public goods funds, those are all part of finding ways to be able to get more capital. The actual institution's capital is the constraint of where it can go. We are, you know, this is, we are the reflection of the ambition of our shareholders. And Mia said this, I don't know where we were a couple of days ago in a panel, and that's exactly what our challenge is. That doesn't mean we can't do more with what we've got. I'm quite ambitious about that. But to really get a much larger number, we do have to have greater capital coming. Now, there are other ways, David, if you have time, to discuss how we can get to putting money to work for the things we were discussing. 
So if you have time, uh, ask me, yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, and I think, and I just want to support Ajay. This is first and foremost a political issue. Countries cannot avoid the responsibility of stepping forward to help save the world. And indeed, I believe that Ajay shouldn't only be relying on public money, but that there is going to have to be a role carved out for non-state actors to be able to have a role. The truth is that we're reaching more and more a position where global public goods will need a dedicated form of funding separate from the development lending that the World Bank does. Um, but until we get there, Ajay knows that one of the, two of the things that I feel strongly about that we really do need to see whether we can get the debt pause clauses for existing instruments, which means a mutual um, variation of existing contracts. Correct. And and that I understand. Because going is a forward process. is fine, but yep. he's got a current problem. Yep. That's the point. And then secondly, I do feel that countries that suffer a climate crisis, a climatic event, slow onset, or a single event ought to be given either like terms in the post-recovery yeah, Even if they are actually Even if they're above countries. and they're not eligible to either. And if they don't have that, it means that they are genuinely making choices about whether to maintain existing spending on social capital and even investment opportunities and growth opportunities as compared to reconstruction. Because the one big thing that we're, and I made the point yesterday in the Climate Action Summit, the issue of the future of the insurance industry is going to be critical. If you have insurance companies already indicating that they won't underwrite fire risk in California, and you have them equally in Florida beginning to retreat and in the Caribbean, then when you know you go to a bank, you're a hotel, you're a business, they say, okay, we'll lend you the money, but we need you to have insurance. You go and look at the insurance premium, all of a sudden they're unaffordable or worse than that, the insurance is not there for you to have because at the end of the day, insurance is not, insurance industry are not going to work if they can't define losses and manage the risk appropriately. So where do we go? That's the reason mainly for the debt pause clauses because when we had the last hurricane, in fact, it was our first, first hurricane in 66 years, the 90% of the houses destroyed or damaged had no insurance, were below the poverty line, sorry, and 95% of them had no insurance. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be more and more of a reality, not just in the global south, but also in the developed world, you're gonna find it more and more happening. And with these flash floods across Europe and in parts of this country, people are going to lose their shirt mm. if there is not an appropriate framework to be able to cover them either through the state or some kind of insurable um, scheme. A poly crisis indeed. Ajay, if I may, I just wanna ask two relatively specific questions. You just said something really fascinating, uh, which Prime Minister Mali- Unlike uh, what seemed, she's been saying, huh? There you go. <laughs> I, I think agreed, which, like what which is that, that the bank is really a reflection of the shareholders' ambitions. The shareholders, of course, being some of the largest economies in the world, the United States, the United Kingdom, China, Japan, France, Germany. Do you believe that the shareholders are not ambitious enough? Look, I think everybody has fiscal challenges and political challenges, so I'm the last one to judge people in her kind of roles in these countries. What I'm trying to do is to first take the cards I've been dealt, fix the bank to the extent I can, make it operate at a faster and better speed, sweat the balance sheet as much as I can, and do a couple of things with the private sector, which I think is a real opportunity, but then there's two others. And one of those is one that really bugs me, and I, she knows what irritates me on this. We, the world spends $1.5 trillion a year on subsidies for fuel and agriculture that have a direct connection to environmental challenges, which cost us $6 trillion a year. That's trillion. <coughs> That's seven and a half trillion. That's many more zeros than the billions we need. That, if we were to repurpose those and redirect those, mm. each billion, two billion, five billion at a time, that is a fairly large sum of money that needs to be thought of how to redirect it to the right place. Mm. Similarly, we've been talking about voluntary carbon markets for a long time. The problem has been that they haven't been constructed in a way that prevents the claim of greenwashing or creates a clean, reliable carbon market. 
we are at a few months away from trying in the case of forestry with 14 countries out of 47. We've done an end-to-end -end jurisdictional kind of audit, so they can't be reforesting here and deforesting there, so you actually get green credit. You put that into the market and you start creating the flow of money to the global south, which is blessed with forests, sun, and wind. Mm. If we start doing this correctly, over time, we can create a diversion of resources that will be politically palatable as well and economically very consequential. So there are some things that you can do quickly, sweating a balance sheet, figuring out how to work better with partners, and doing stuff with the Inter-American Development Bank that directly impacts her. Those are very important, and I will never reduce the importance of those. But then there are these couple of other things that we have to pay attention to. Yeah. Mm. Ajay is absolutely correct, and I don't think there's any single silver bullet. Um, obviously, political will is the major thing, but there are things that he is doing and can do. And then there are other things that are peculiar to regions. In Europe, um, guarantees, for example, don't count as a liability. And therefore, you can use those guarantees in a way to help leverage even further. Um, in, in, in some instances, I'm still hopeful, and it may be a long hope, that we can create a climate mitigation trust globally anchored in both the IMF and the World Bank so that persons who want to use their SDRs mm -hmm. can use them without it becoming a liability on their um, on balance their sheet. central bank's balance sheet. On That's the central what bank, she's exactly. And at the same time, if we can do that, it then seeks to get the best projects globally to compete for that money, because at the end of the day, mitigation doesn't have to be in any particular region. It just matters that we're pursuing mitigation globally. At the same time, we need to have a, a, a very strong conversation with the oil and gas companies to deal with the methane leakages, because methane is in fact propelling us to that path of 1.5 faster than almost anything else. And yet we have success in the past. When the Montreal Convention came about to be able to deal with the aerosols, aerosols. and all of that, nobody thought that we would have been as successful today as we Correct. have been. Correct. And I just don't understand, therefore, why the companies are not seeking to be able to deal with the methane leakages because it makes good business sense for them too. Methane. If you look at rice, the cultivation of rice, it's a big source of methane. Why is that? Because you flood the rice during planting. If you leave the water there through its entire period, all the way to harvesting, that is 8 to 10 percent of agricultural methane emissions. You can actually change those irrigation practices. It's we're doing it as the bank in Vietnam, in China, in Indonesia. It brings the methane emission down 60%. This is not expensive. Your yield improves. It pays back quickly. There's stupid little things like that that can be done now. And the problem is we need to get them done. Yeah. That's the thing. Prime Minister, you just mentioned oil and gas. And I want to ask both of you about the role of the fossil fuel industry in global development and in Barbados in particular. The World Bank is under pretty unrelenting criticism for continuing to fund oil and gas That's projects. That's actually incorrect, so I'm really glad. Thank you for asking me. What, what is? So that we are funding oil and gas. So just to be completely clear, last year, this is before I joined, it's nothing to do with me. The World Bank, <laughs> otherwise you'll think it's, I did it miraculously. I've been here 100 days. So the, the World Bank's last year's funding of fossil fuel. First of all, the bank has not funded any coal since 2010. Any coal? Zero. Last year, the total bank commitments were 122 billion. The total amount given to fossil fuels, in this case, only natural gas, was 170 million. That's 0.2%. That's 20 basis points as a banker. That's what the number was. So when P and that's for natural gas as part of a transition. And by the way, natural gas is what lots of countries use. So it's part of a transition. So this is just factually incorrect. And I would love for you to help me correct the facts. All right. Well, you just had a chance right there. Yeah. Barbados. I, I, I want to add to that, too, because I am a prime minister of a country. I'm not an academic. And I have to live in the real world. Oh, sure. She used to be a lawyer, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Better than being a banker. <laughs> <laughs>
you see why we get along? <laughs> a lawyer and a banker. <laughs> but, but the reality is, <laughs> and this is why I'm calling all the time and with greater urgency now for granularity. We get the lights and the cameras and we talk about ambition. But if we don't match capacity and commitment, we're not going anywhere. And I keep making the point that for many small states, we, first of all, do not determine or command the market. So we get what is left as crumbs. I want batteries. I've spent half my day today trying to search again for more innovative battery solutions. Because if the cost of batteries, first of all, if I can't get them, it's a problem. And if the cost of batteries is high, it means that the cost of the renewable energy will be high. And it means that those consumers who would prefer to have a lower rate will say, well, just let me stay with the fossil fuels or let me deal with natural gas. The bottom line is that natural gas continues to be a bridge in fuel because there is a genuine lack of capacity globally and we're not spending sufficient Correct. time to deal and with these issues. You need to build base load, yes. and that's what she's yeah. referring to. Yeah, and we're not spending sufficient time dealing with these issues. So it then becomes impossible to say, just get rid of that overnight. Right. Now, having said that, we would like, I would love somebody to pay me to keep our natural gas in the ground in our oceans. But if they don't, how am I going to finance my way to net zero? And how am I going to ensure that my country has access to a credible supply of energy? And these are the things that are getting lost purely because we are moving so late and we have to move so quickly that we are focused on the immediate things of finance, we're focused on political will, but we're not focused on the just industrial strategy or the supply of goods and plant and equipment. And these are the things that bother me because year after year we mention it, but we're not seeing the kind of progress on those other things for the granularity. Thank you. And this, that was the Jeopardy version because she just gave the answer to the question I was going to answer <laughs> about why Barbados was recently opening up exploration off the coast, but you just heard the answer just in reverse order. I, I, and let me be clear. We, we are talking about it, and, and the cabinet has had lengthy discussion mm -hmm. because we don't definitely don't want oil as it is. Although I can make the point too, the problem, and I'm a lawyer, the strategic focus is the emissions. So until such time as there is technology to suppress those emissions, no oil for sure. Yeah. Until such time as we can get access to what we need to provide continuous energy to our population, then we may have to consider natural gas as a bridge and fuel. Not because we want to, but because we're being forced to by reason of the way in which the world is constructed and the supply chains and everything else. Again, that complexity and that tension on such vivid display. We've only got a few more minutes left, but I want to ask each of you a closing question. Ajay, earlier today I spoke with Bill Gates on this stage, and he really throwed cold water on the notion that there was trillions of dollars in capital waiting on the sidelines to come in if only institutions like the World Bank would take that first layer of risk, which is, again, sort of an integral part of what has been described in the Bridgetown Initiative and other reform agendas. How do you think about the potential for private capital to play a meaningful role? And what do you say to his criticism that that money just simply isn't there? So I think there is a lot of money in the private sector looking for places to invest. I don't think Bill is saying at any point that that money doesn't exist. He's got a little bit of it himself. But, <laughs> but and, he's, and he's doing good things with his money. So uh, the, at the end of the day, the issue is, why does that private money not flow into these emerging market countries? And there are three or four critical reasons. And the first one is, if they don't have clear policies on the ground, tariff guarantees. You know, if I go in there and put up a hydroelectric power plant, and then the next prime minister comes along, who's not as interesting as Mia, and says, actually, I don't really care what Mia committed. I'm reconstructing the deal with you. There's no private sector investor who will feel confident with that. It's just reality. That needs a starting point. It is amazing how much of a difference that makes. This, that's the political regulatory risk issue. Then people talk about execution risk. That is the private sector's job. They are willing to take it on. They will take it on. 
The real challenge then remains is the foreign exchange and currency risk. Mm -hmm. And in the foreign exchange and currency risk, again, I would parse it into two portions. There's a portion that every private sector investor must be willing to take based on what they know is the average likelihood of depreciation or devaluation of that country's currency over a period of time. They factor it into their spreadsheets. What they cannot take is the extremes mm -hmm. of events that they do not control in any way. There has to be a way for institutions, not just like mine, but like the IMF, us, and others, to provide some cushion there. The question is, that risk is still there. Who's absorbing that risk? If it comes onto my balance sheet to keep my AAA rating, I need my shareholders to put money back in, or I need to do a back-ended guarantee with her country, which I can do cheaper than she can. There are intelligent ways to find our way through this. We've created processes to work on this. I would tell you, don't think the door will open and the trillions will flood in, but don't give up hope. Mm. You get a sense of just how much work is being done to try to get these reforms done. Prime Minister, in closing, we have the fall meetings of the World Bank and the IMF coming up next month. We've got COP starting the month after that. What are you looking for in those months ahead that's going to give you the confidence that not only all the people assembled this week who have been saying all the right things, but also all those other actors that actually are going to determine whether these kinds of reforms get done are actually making the kind of progress you say you need to see. What are you looking for and what's your message to them? I think the things that can be done by the bank and the fund need to be done. The fund needs a quota increase. The truth is that the fund has put almost a, billion, uh, um, a trillion dollars in the global economy in the last few years. If there are future shocks that are of scale, the fund will be at serious, serious problems to be able to come and provide that role again to the global... For the macro fiscal stability. The macro fiscal stability. Secondly, as Ajay says, we have some increase in capital. He can do a lot with it, but we know that that's not going to be enough. Having said that, we need to start with what we have and ensure right. that we sweat use it. what we have, sweat what we have, but have a pipeline of funding potentially coming thereafter because what we don't have is time in project execution if we are to build resilience. If we're doing coastal projects, those can only happen if we do the feasibility according to the currents and, and, and the moon and stars, and that sometimes if you miss one, you have to wait another year. The rate at which the climate crisis is unfolding, we simply do not have the time. This is the season of superlatives. And if we are to ensure that we are not victims of that season of superlatives, then we need to be able to see quicker action on a number of fronts. The use of the guarantees, the use of the Climate Mitigation Trust, lawyers, lawyers who are paid well will create that trust for you in less than a month. <laughs> Um, similarly, <laughs> with respect... Bankers who are paid well will help <laughs> you, by the way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and what is clear from the conversations with the bankers and others is that we also need some standard clauses Correct. that will allow us not to have to go and recreate and redraft and negotiate from scratch in every instance. In the same way that the world, to be able to secure restructuring of debt, introduced collective action clauses as a norm in the year 2000, that shifted how debt was restructured completely. We need to work out what are those clauses that are necessary to help deconstruct risk in lending to the Global South and to do some of the other things that we're doing like the debt pause clauses. And if we can get that for existing debt, that goes a long way to helping existing countries. And if we can get a commitment from the shareholders or the directors of the bank to be able to say that in a crisis, that they will on-lend to countries at either like terms, that is also a major improvement. And then finally, we really, really, really need a settlement of what constitutes debt sustainability. If you ask me to continue to reach a trajectory that is too steep, it is like asking a human being to lose 12 to 15 pounds a month when at some point the body is incapable of doing normal things and responsible things. So it means that, can I lose it at three, four pounds, or six pounds even, eight pounds? Yes. But then to carry it too steep means that you put at risk the social fabric of a society. You can bring back down debt overnight, but you can't rebuild the social fabric when destroyed of a society in under a generation. Thank you.
What an honor. Prime Minister Motley, President Banga, thank you so much. Thank you so much, David.